Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this very special session entitled Man of Metal, Rusi Modi's Vision and Drive for Corporate India. Much has been said, much has been written, much has been talked about this great legend of corporate India, about his management styles, and I think the greatest example that he has left behind over 50 years of his association with Tata Steel is the company Tata Steel, which he joined when it was Tata Iron and Steel Company Limited. He was known as the man of classes and the man of masses. He could very comfortably meet up with the monarchy, the prime ministers, presidents, the bureaucrats, and even drive down to the workers' colony in Jamshedpur, sit across on a charpoy and chat with his workers, drive into the canteen and eat with them. That was his span. So, you know, uh, there's really, uh, when we talk about his vision for corporate India, I think today when you see Tata Steel over 100 years and what the company has achieved, I think a lot of the founding and the foundations have been built by this great man. So what I thought this evening, instead of talking more about his corporate vision, is actually getting to know the man a little more intimately. What was it like? What, what did he do? What really drove him? What were really his characteristic traits? I've had the good fortune of working with him for a good period of time. And I know for certain, and I must mention this because it is the literary meat, that he was a voracious reader. And one of the things that he always imbibed us to do was to read, and he would read a lot of biographies of great statesmen, leaders, uh, presidents, prime ministers. His favorite, of course, was Napoleon. And he even had a portrait of Napoleon right in his private study. But ironically, uh, a couple of years before he passed away, uh, he was asked by his nephew, Jimmy Modi, how would you like to be remembered, Uncle Rusi? And I quote what he said. He said, uh, when I go, yeah. He said, everyone thinks that I'm an extraordinary man. When I go, I want to be remembered as an extraordinary, extraordinarily ordinary man. And therefore, ladies and gentlemen, to share that extraordinary life of this very ordinary man, I'm extremely proud and privileged to have two of his very, very close friends, Mr. Naresh Kumar, who really needs no introduction, who I think met him when he was all of 12, sir, when he was playing tennis at South Club, and really has been through Mr. Modi not just as a friend, as a business partner, because Naresh Kumar and company and Tata Steel share and till date share a very close business relationship. And then not only I know for a fact that his family, his wife, his children, their children, the grandchildren, were more than a family to Mr. Kumar. So I think Mr. Kumar can really take us through a lot of the anecdotes, his personal life and traits that made this man who really dreamed of corporate India. And on my right is Mr. Paul Chatterjee, who I met coming into Tata Center many years ago as a journalist to interview. And I know for certain that in his later part of life, Mr. Paul Chatterjee became really what we know as family. At a time when Mr. Modi was unwell and couldn't move out and there was any problem at home, the call would come to Mr. Chatterjee and he would be rushed to 5 Sialipo and he would have to sit with Mr. Modi and convince him to eat and talk to him and cheer him up. So I think I couldn't have got a better panel this evening. So let us go back and let us share with them and let us understand from them what made this man one of India's greatest man managers, a legend that really drew the vision for corporate India and built a company such as Tata Steel. So I'd like to start, Mr. Kumar, with your first memories and association with Mr. Modi and some of the interesting uh, examples and uh, incidents that you can recall that brought out some of the traits and characteristics that made him such a great man. First of all, thank you for asking me. And uh, there was an exodus as soon as Jaya Bachchan left. Well, good. I'm not a film star. I'm just an ordinary tennis player. And it's great for me to hobnob with the literary world. And a uh, galaxy of people have come. They're very good. Uh, yes, I know Rusi from when I was, I think, 13 or 14. And we played a lot of tennis together. And uh, he had a friendship where over 65 years long time and during this time uh, I got to know him very well the things he did the things he said the way he acted 
Uh, so what I'll try and tell you is that uh, I'll try and give you the incidents in our life from which you can derive what sort of a person he was, what was his character and so on and so forth. Uh, to start with, I'd say that I remember him always saying that, you know, Naresh, there were three great Herobians. There was Nehru, there was me, and, and there was Churchill. So Nehru and Churchill are dead, so I'm carrying the weight of the world on my shoulders. So he, of course, now no longer is with us, but he joked. But industry-wise, he wasn't far short of them. He was a great man and uh, a very versatile man. He had multi facets to his personality. If you can imagine the things that he could do, uh, it's mind-boggling. I think it was in 65 that they had a film, BBC made a film on the, called The Money Makers. They were the five or six great industrialists of the world. Annie Ali of uh, Italy, there was Harvey Johnson, there was Stanley Ho, Marita of Japan, and of course, uh, our Tikra was there, Rusi, bringing up the rear, I thought. So they produced these films and I saw them very, very repeatedly and carefully. And, uh, well, that's the first time I think Rusi won a gold medal. He was so far ahead of all these people. Uh, none of them had the tremendous versatility that he had. For instance, uh, uh, who, who would know that the various things he could do? Uh, he could uh, do card shot, he, he could do card tricks, he could uh, play a round of golf, play tennis, go to Princess uh, nightclub, stay up till three and arrive in the morning fresh as a daisy. He could put away 16 egg omelets like nothing and drive for half an hour and say that uh, I can't drive on an empty stomach. He, used to, he had an incinerator in his stomach which would turn out all these calories and burn them. So there are many such incidents that happened in our lives and every time I learned something new from him. He, uh, I'm a little stuck as to where to start with. Now, um, I think the best way to describe his personality, personality is to tell, us, tell you all about the things he could do. I already told you about his playing tennis, golf, and also told you about what are the other things he could do. And now, I'm, since my memory is bad, I'm 86 now, so you have to excuse me. I'm going to have a look at this. So where would you find a, a chief executive officer who could do so many things? I'm telling you, his, his sort of spread was fantastic. Um, I think some of the incidents that come to my life, uh, come to my, this thing was that, for instance, he learned to fly when he was over 50. He flew his old plane. Um, without a problem. And his work ethics is a, were around his ability to pick people. When he picked his staff, he never got a good uh, whole dossier on the family and everything. He looked at them instinctively, called them home for dinner and a party, and mixed with them and put them under pressure. And that's what, when it was decided whether he would take them or not. His instinct to know how they behaved under pressure. Uh, as you know, he wasn't an MBA or a scientist. And when he recruited, he paid no attention to such degrees. On one such occasion, I remember his, uh, after his a lot of uh, uh, sort of uh, appointments he had given, which were sort of uh, not highly thought of by the intellectuals. His secretary rang me up one day, he said, Naresh, you know, this is the limit. He's now employed a failed film star. So there was great laughter in the crowd. And this failed film star then was Casey Mera. He became the number one in the works. With no technical qualification, 
He had no uh, acumen or business acumen. He just picked him up raw and found him to be a good person and very affable and able to get on with people. He took him, we all went to Timna, we, where Tata's have a bungalow and it's in the top of a hill and he put KC under a lot of pressure. They pulled his leg the whole day, called him names and everything, but KC never turned a hair. He was absolutely solid. So he then knew that this chap was going to deliver. So his picking of people, his uh, greatness was in picking the right people and directing them. Many other things are there, for instance, uh, his ability to get on with everybody. Like, uh, I mean, he could uh, sort of go to Ascot, wear a top hat, and have drinks with uh, all the lords and ladies. And, you know, he could pick up the Pushkawala from outside Victoria and put him at ease in just half an hour. This vaulting over classes was his greatest, greatest asset. He could uh, sort of get set with anybody at the drop of a hat. He, just a few sentences and he had got them in his grasp. All through, he, uh, when he came into power, he was looking after the collieries, the ore mines, the collieries, the works. <coughs> In the collieries and ore mines, they had thousands of people and they're out in the wilds, there's nothing to do. So he concentrated on going there every weekend and wherever he went, there was a party, uh, there was jollification. You know, music and joy was really embedded in his soul. He loved it. I mean, he was fantastic. He could sort of get even the flattest fellow up to doing wonderful things. So he used to go to the collieries and buck up these people and he used to tell me that why can't you get some players and then this happened one day that uh, I managed to get a Wimbledon champion Santana and his uh, doubles partner Arela to uh, Jamadova to the, go and play at the collieries. You know now Federer and like charge for two million for a day. But they didn't charge anything, so they were, all, they were fun. And so he took off on his plane from Jamshedpur, and when we were landing, he was piloting it. He uh, sort of talked back to me and said, uh, can you see the ground? I, how far is it? So Santana and Arena nearly fainted, saying, how is this chap can't see the ground, and what's he doing? <laughs> so uh, anyway, tennis was played, and uh, we went to his home for drinks, and uh, he... Uh, uh, we planned this thing, as I told you earlier, he could, he was a card shop, he could easily do anything, deal you a hand. So I told uh, Santana, I said, you know, he's an easy touch, so why don't you suggest playing uh, flush with him, and you can, you can pick up some pocket money. So Santana was very keen, had a quick shower and came back and said, you know, I love cards and so on and so forth, and Rusi then uh, started dealing with them. and. Uh, uh, first few hands, he played like a real amateur. He turned every, you know, he said, no, no, uh, did stupid things until Santana and Arilla both went to the room and bought their purses full of money. And uh, they thought they had him. And this went on for a little while. And then uh, Rusi dealt the master hand where he, he dealt himself three aces, Santana three kings, and Arilla three jacks. So. <coughs> These two Spaniards sort of emptied their wallets onto the table and uh, Santana and Arilla had a side show and Arilla withdrew and then Santana uh, said, okay, uh, I have no more money, uh, can we turn these rupees into dollars? <laughs> so Rishi said, all right, you can turn them into dollars. So Santana with a flourish sort of foot his three kings down and with the other hand he was trying to rake in the money and Rusi caught his hand and said just a minute and put down his three aces <laughs> so these two boys in fact with their heads in their hands and uh, they were really overcome uh, after a little bit of fooling around the force refunded the money that in his I mean he, he could do well, like in the colonies for instance I'll tell you a lovely story there was a, 
uh, arrogant young Punjabi in one of the group of colonies who uh, was very capable, of course, and they knew it. And uh, loosely at a party, he mentioned that uh, about Rusi, that he's a drunkard and he's out night clubbing, he's not a good chap, and this, that, and the other. And of course, Rusi's grapevine, his secretary, and all. Uh, brought this news to Rusi and uh, Rusi said, okay, uh, tell him to come tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. So the scene was laid in Rusi's veranda where he said, Naresh, you're going to be having breakfast. And he got an empty bottle of uh, whiskey, filled it with tea, exactly the same color as whiskey, and sat down at one end of the table. <coughs> and uh, Chawla, uh, I shouldn't tell you his name, arrived at the dot of 8 o'clock, walked in and uh, Rusi said, come on, have a drink, it's, it's never too early to start. Chawla said, no sir, I don't drink. He said, but I drink, you know that, uh, I don't know how long I'm going to last. He said, no, I never said anything, I never said anything. He said, no, I'm not saying that. Anyway, Rusi poured himself a drink uh, of uh, so-called whiskey, walloped it down and told me, I don't know if this is as good a whiskey, but it's very bad, believe me. So while this drama was going on, this poor Punjabi fellow was very upset and thinking that he's going to lose his job. And um, there happened to be another Parsi gentleman from one of the collieries who turned up, uh, uh, some of an oldish man. He told Rusi, why, what are you doing? He so grabbed, uh, grabbed hold of the bottle and there was like a tussle between him and Rusi till Rusi threw him out. And uh, anyway, uh, Chawla went home uh, quite appeased and in the years to come, a couple of years, do you know he became the chief of all the collieries. In spite of saying all these things against him, Rusi used to rise about this. He never let these things worry him. Worry him. And all his, all his employees or people who worked with him, they just loved it. Another incident... Uh, Mr. Kumar, I'll, sorry. I'll yeah. now take a break. I'll, I think some of the traits that you mentioned are really hard to find and I don't know how young leaders would be able to imbibe that because this is so God-given and so God-gifted. But I'd like to turn to Mr. Chatterjee. You know, he started out as a journalist meeting him and then became one of his most closest companions in his latter years. So could you share your anecdotes, your thoughts? I want to keep it a little open in the beginning and then I'll go into more specifics. How did this happen and what did you learn and share with him and how did this professional relationship turn into such a personal relationship? Uh, thank you, uh, Shumit. Uh, good evening, everyone. And all those uh, remaining after the exit of uh, uh, Mrs. Jaya Bachchan. Uh, I wish uh, our interview was slated just before hers, so many more would have been able to hear about this remarkable gentleman Rusi Homasji Modi. Uh, first of all, uh, Shumit uh, quoted Jimmy uh, Modi saying that he was an extraordinarily ordinary man. Rusi Modi, to the extent that I knew, was, uh, of course, he, was a, he loved life and he lived life king size, but then you see, he was also humility personified. You see, and uh, he would like to understate himself, you know, whatever people would say about him. He was aware of his qualities, he was aware, you know, of who he was. But then you see, uh, before I come uh, to a few of his anecdotes, uh, just like my good friend Naresh, I never realized, looking at Naresh, he's turned 86. It almost looks like he's turned overnight 86. He doesn't look a day above 66 or 56. Uh, and he reads without a paper, and I can't read without my glasses. Uh, be that as it may, talking of uh, Rusi Modi, the topic of today's discussion was to do with him and corporate India. You know, I started, since I know Rusi Modi, I knew Rusi Modi so closely and so well for about 37, 39 years. Uh, it was uh, ironical that I should have to call two or three of my friends who are uh, quite, uh, I mean, they're iconic uh, as corporate uh, personalities. And I asked them, what would you think is uh, uh, Rusi's legacy uh, to the corporate world? 
And he, and they said something. I mean, I couldn't agree more. I'm sure Naresh would be in agreement with me. So would Shumit, who was his executive assistant at a very crucial period. Uh, rather unanimously, the opinion was he was a champion at people's skills. And the corporate world would remember him as a leader par excellence with the kind of skills no corporate leader could dream achieving. I say achieving. Rusi, as Sadarish uh, told you, had come from Harrow. He moved uh, to Oxford after that. And by his own admission, you know, most of the anecdotes that Naresh said, Naresh was probably witness to a few of those anecdotes, or most of those anecdotes. But Rusi was the one who confided in me many, many anecdotes. And Rusi was a person who was very honest and he could be very blunt, you know, in, in, in the way he spoke to people. He would be speaking the truth all the time. And uh, he was a remarkable, he was a person like no other. If I, in all these years of my life, if I were to talk of five extraordinary people, Rusi would easily head the list. Now, talking of Rusi, I want to say a couple of things uh, before I move over to uh, Naresh. You know, both of us should exchange, uh, I will play a little table tennis so you can hear a bit from Naresh and hear a bit from me. Uh, the thing is, uh, we've heard uh, quite a few things about Rusi already uh, to show what a large-hearted, what a colorful, what a versatile human being he was. But then you see, talking of people's skills, I remember the first time he woke me up uh, in Jamshedpur very, very early in the morning. You see, I said, Utpar, get up, just, you know, don't have to take a shower, just get up, put something on, decent, and come with me. You know, and I remember having gone to the wax, the plant, you see, and he said, this is where my journey started. You see, his father, after he came out of Oxford, while he was in Oxford, you see, I mean, this business of Mr. Chawla, whoever he mentioned, talking of his late, uh, late night clubbing, etc. Well, I mean, of course, he was wrong. But then Rusi had experienced that night clubbing based business while he was in Oxford because he spent more than his father could send him. So what he did was he had to cross over, go into France, and there he played in nightclubs. And that's how he got familiar with the songs of Edith Piaf, the legendary French singer. And he would play the piano. You see, and he was, until the other day, he was, everybody was familiar with his, you know, wonderful, you know, hands were absolutely wonderful on the piano. I mean, he had learned it very early and he would play and he would love to entertain. I mean, no matter who you were, if you asked for a number, he would be very generous, very large-hearted. He would play it for you, if you knew it, of course. And then most of the popular numbers he knew. But then you see, I am thinking of something else also. When, he is fa when his father, and when he came back to India, his father, you know, I mean, Sir Homi Modi, uh, told him, you know, they discussed what he would do. They decided he would be in Tata Steel. And, uh, you know, when they're trying to work out a good position for him, an apt position for somebody who has studied at Harrow and at Oxford, well, what Rusi told me was very simple. His father told him, you are going to start from the very bottom. So he said, Utpal, I'm not going to try and imitate the way Mr. Modi put it. May his soul rest in peace after all. So he said, Utpal, I started as a khalasi. He used the term khalasi. I worked with all the people on the floor. I knew them all by name. And I work the hard way. But only when you start working with them from the grassroots, from the lowest level, would you, can you get prepared to climb higher and higher, take more and more responsibilities, you know, one period after another. And lo and behold, that day, I remember when I had gone around quite a lot, he said, would you like some hot idlis or would you like some dosas? There was a canteen inside the the workshop of Tata Steel. So, you know, we agreed to have some idlis. And in the, in the meantime, while we were walking towards the canteen, he suddenly said, 
Hi, Lakshmi. You know, there was somebody called Lakshmi. And you know, the man came running to him, Ah, Saab, Salam, Saab. And he said, Tumara peti kaisi hai? You know, he had a way of speaking Hindi. So, because he was a Parsi and, you know, he, he, he was very proud of the way he spoke. And he said, Utpal, I cannot possibly speak the Urdu Hindi or the Sanskrit Hindi. I speak my own Hindi. Whatever it is, everybody understood him. And he said, uh, Hum doctor bheja tha kal raat ko. Doctor aya tha. He said, Haa sahab, aya tha. Kuch diya, adawa diya sahab, sab kuch hai. Beti hai, bachi hai sahab. And then he tried to bend down. Hey! तुम भूल जा रहे हो तुम्हारे साथ हम काम किया था और तुम हमको क्या कर रहे हैं अभी देखो हमारा दोस्त आया है हमारे यंग दोस्त आया है उसके पास हमको तुम क्या शर्म शर, कर रहा है यू नो दैट्स व्हाट ही ट्राई टू से बी दैट एज इट आई फाउंड इवन इन द कैंटीन पीपल टू नोटिस व्हेन द बड़ा साहब है जस्ट एंटर बट देन यू सी कॉल द मीच बाय नेम अमेजिंग थिंक ऑफ दिस मैन With hundreds, thousands, and thousands of employees all around, and he seemed to know everybody by name. Who, which corporate chief can you think of in this country of ours who would do it? He spoke of the five money makers that BBC had brought out. I, I, well, I featured in two films: one made by BBC and the other made by Sandeep Ray, which was done. You see, I mean, towards the end of his life, I interviewed him in, in that particular film, and believe me. One thing I do remember about Rusi, traveling with him, you know, I'll just sort of jog your memory a bit and take you back to more than 100 years ago. You see, a voyage has started here in Calcutta, went to Dover, and it had two passengers, one who became a very celebrated passenger, and the other after whom a town became named. The celebrated passenger was Swami Vivekananda. And the gentleman after whom a town got named was Sir Jamshed Ji Tata. Now both became terrific companions. But the elder person was the one who was the listener. He made the young people person talk because, you know, he was in awe of this young philosopher who was going to attend the Parliament of Religions in Chicago. So this was the first leg of the tour from Calcutta to Dover. So while going, he said, you are making so much of money. You are there, you know. Why don't you try? Because by this time, Vivekananda had traveled the length and breadth of India. And he has seen poverty at his worst. He has seen the wealthy people. There are a few wealthy ruling over the mass, you know, poor, masses of poor. This was something he did not quite appreciate or like. And he set up the first Ramakrishna mission because after all, Jaya Bachchan was talking about the Swamiji coming from Ramakrishna mission. I'm not going to talk of Swamiji's or of Vivekananda so much as one statement. You know, when Sajam Sheji Tata said, what do you want me to do? Just tell me something. Whatever you say, I'll do it. He said, well, your company or your factory is based in an area where you have lots of tribals and adivasis. So, to cut a long story short, ladies and gentlemen, a 20, within a 20 mile radius of Tata's, unless somebody from Tata's still here would correct me, you see, they decided that every adivasi or tribal residing would be looked after by the company. Mr. J.R.D. Tata could not take up the responsibility later. So it was left to Rusi Modi who spent 53 good years in Tata. You could take Rusi Modi out of Jamshedpur, but you could not take Jamshedpur out of Rusi Modi. You know, he was so devoted till the last day, he would pine for Jamshedpur. You see, one day he took me to, the, you know, 18 miles from his office, to one of the huts. And he told me, Utpal, you'd be surprised. In Calcutta, no matter how clean a house may be, they would be jealous of the manner in which these people practice cleanliness and hygiene. So what you do is open your shoes before entering. And by the way, it's a custom to offer water. So when they offer you water, my God, don't look the other way, drink it. I, you know, he saw my look. I don't know what was there in my look. But after looking at me, he says, 
Are you looking at me like that? Don't worry. After all, I have supplied the water. And then you see, when I entered that hut, my God, the world went around. The big man had come. And there was quite a crowd of people. I sat in one corner of the room. It was really indeed spick and span. I mean, you had to go there, you had to go there to uh, be in one of the huts to believe what Rusi had to say and why he has such a high opinion of their cleanliness, their hygiene, because he believed in this himself. And we, today, Narendra Modi is talking Swaj Bharat. They are the people who started it long back. So that was the vision you said. I, I, just, I, just, I just complete one thing, just one small thing. Uh, Sumit, with, without this permission. You see, two years before he died, or one and a half years, I, I, I was there with him about a week before he died, but two years before he died, you see, we were discussing life and death. You know, at the Belvedere uh, place. You know, and uh, Rusi thought a moment to salute Pal. Nobody remembers you after you die. He said, what? He said, yes, you shut your eyes, they talk about you for a few days, and you just fade away from their memories, you're gone. You know, I just looked at him and stared. And then later on, you know, after some time it stuck me, and then I told him, Rusi, I just want to remind you of something, remember? You took me to that hut off Jamshedpur, 18 miles from your office, you remember? Oh, that, yes. He said, do you remember? I was sitting in one corner while these people were busy talking to you. I was looking at a wall. On the wall there were pictures of all the gods and goddesses that you could think of. Today, Saraswati Puja, there was Saraswati, there was Durga, there was Lakshmi, there was everybody that you could think of. And in between them, lo and behold, whose picture would you find but that of Rusi Modi? Because Vivekananda had taught Sir Jamshed Ji taught her, service to mankind is service to God. And this was something that Rusi Modi believed in. He believed in the upliftment of the poor, the underprivileged. Nobody left him empty-handed. Long after he had left Tata's in his house, when he and I sat, two poor people had come who were no longer with Tata's and they came for help. Who could they go to but their own quote-unquote God? Bada Saab, Rusi Modi. You say. Thank you very much. That was indeed very enlightening. You know, when you're talking about corporate vision and corporate India, Mr. Kumar, I mean, today one reads about friendships in business that go sour. And you have been such a close friend and a business associate. Your two companies have grown together and you've been a great support to Tata Steel as well. How do you manage this very, very, you know, interesting relationship? One, I'm sure as a business partner, you would have had your differences with him. And yet you were his closest friend. And how did you manage to traverse this path through ups and downs? Well, that's uh, not a difficult question in the sense that I just do my work properly and honestly. And uh, he never did any favors to me at all. And uh, I also didn't want him to do favors. Uh, if I did something for the Tata Steel Company, I did it because it was my duty to do it. Not because of my friendship with him. And I remember when we first started, uh, those days steel had a big premium, so if he could give me 10 wagons of steel, I could live for two years without any problem. But I never took anything like that. So I came up with ideas that helped them and helped me as well. Um, so it was a wonderful relationship and uh, funny, uh, when I started uh, sort of uh, work with them, I used to play tennis to the club and I used to say, okay, let's uh, have a game. And it very great friend. Then it occurred to me that why don't I get some business from the Tatas and uh, I felt a little guilty because I was playing with him with a motive and, but soon I found that he was such good company. He was full of fun and frolic. He was one of the super gamesmen in, in sport. He, he could put in a word or two and I remember playing uh, against Mahinda Singh who was from Oxford and never left his Ox Oxford accent there, brought it here. And uh, we were having a close game and he uh, said, Mahindra, do you mind? Let me know, how do you manage to keep up your accent? After which Mahindra just collapsed, he couldn't. So he was a great gamesman. Even in life he was a gamesman and he was very clever. And uh, I had no problems. Uh, in fact, uh, I, 
lucky that I enjoy many other such corporates who work with me, and I enjoy working with them. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chatterjee, back to you. You know, you've spent a lot of time, and when he was post-retirement and he was no longer with Mobile or with Tata Steel, did he share his thoughts about Indian general and corporate India and his disappointments, or did he share companies or what he thought about future leaders? Would you be able to share something with us on that? Yes, I would, uh, but uh, two things, Shumit, I mean, on condition, two yeah. things, which Naresh, my friend, and my elder friend would surely agree with. Uh, number one, Rusi was a person who believed in values. When you talk about the corporate, this thing, you see everything was based on values. Values that he imbibed from his mother, parents, from his teachers, but more importantly from his parents, and he was particularly fond of his mother. I must interrupt you for a minute. I remember once when he used to interview people, he would ask a lot of personal questions, and I remember asking him, why do you go so personal? I mean, normally you're interviewing for a job. So he said, values, Shramit, are built by the family, not by an organization. So when someone joins the organization at age 18, 20, 21, the values are already inbuilt. Check for the right values before you ever hire anyone, and that's a lesson I learned from him. Sorry. Very good. Thank you. Well, uh, he believed in his values. He believed that these values should be ingrained in a person. And even when he was in his 70s, even when he was uh, just getting into his 80s, he still spoke of his mother with such fondness. It was so touching. She was a person, you know, to him, anything to do with discipline meant his mother. You see, I mean, he went by that discipline. I mean, certain basic things. Let us talk of punctuality. I remember Rusi and I were invited to some place uh, in the evening at about 7 o'clock. So he told me, Utpal, come by 5.30. So I reached him, reached his house by about 5 minutes to 5.30. That's 5.25. And then, you know, uh, I found Rusi saying, let me uh, get dressed. Mind you, when I was uh, working with my first newspaper, I remember the administrative front, there was a retired general manager of the Eastern Railway. And he had uh, told me, uh, well, in his wisdom, uh, if you're invited to cocktails and dinner, and if, if the card says 7 o'clock, always make sure you go at 7.45. I said, why? I said, no, 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 don't ever go at 7. People will think you're greedy. Or people will think you know, you're being right on time. Uh, for other reasons. I mean, don't go there. Go always a little late. You know, it's never done, never on. That was the lesson that he had taught me long, I mean, just about one or two years before I had met uh, Rusi for the first time. When the same thing happened, after 5.30, he says, Oh, but you've come. Right on dot, as I see. Very good, very good. You said, because, hey, saab kya piega, pucho. Ah, somebody tells uh, Amar or somebody, you know, and then he quickly says, Utpal, I must get dressed and get change and, you know, get ready. You know, when Rusi changed and he came and sat, you know, he changed for that 7 o'clock meeting. And we had plenty of time. And the place was in Alipur itself, not far from his place. And I said, why so early, Rusi? He said, uh, well, we're going to start 15 minutes early to be there 5 minutes before 7. I said, but you're going to be there, I mean, 5 minutes to 7, there'll be nobody there. And then I told him what the general manager had told me. He said, well, I don't agree with him one bit, he told me, loudly. I said, but we'll be the first to be there. He said, so what, Uppal? Somebody, after all, has to be there first. So what if it's you and I? We must be there first. Now, if you talk of punctuality, not just a trait, but as something, you know, that is part of your system, your way of moving about, Efficiency. He was a perfectionist. He could not take anything. The picture was a little, you know, uh, tilted by just a degree or two. You know, it would strike him. He would call Ganga. And then, you know, immediately get the thing settled there and then. In everything he expected, what he would do himself. So something by example. He would lead by example. He absolutely, he would lead by example. Whatever the case may be. And second thing, if anybody went there with a complaint or whatever, 
check whether he was right or wrong. And he would attack the problem immediately and solve it that very day. Finished. He would not let anything wait or anything pending. No procrastination. Nothing would be pending. Mr. Kumar, do you know, uh, I know that character building was very important to him. And I remember the time when we were young officers of Tata Steel, extracurricular activities were very important, which I don't see in most corporates today. If you tell your boss you're leaving at 6 o'clock today, you want to go and play or you have some other extracurriculars, you're actually frowned upon, if I may make that statement in a public forum. But he kind of encouraged that and we actually learned a lot. Sports meant a lot to him. So would you like to share whether this, how this came about and why he felt that way and why was character building he felt was so important through sports and extracurricular activities, which would make an all-rounded manager? Yeah, well, I think oh, most of us know the great advantages that sport can give you and how it helps you in becoming an all-round person. And he himself was a very sporting fellow. So this brings me to one of my best stories about him, a short. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, when he was in charge of the office here, he used to steal away on Wednesday afternoons to play tennis at the South Club. And that was one of the playing days. And uh, Sir Jahangir Gandhi, who was then the boss of Jamshedpur and his, his sort of immediate superior, uh, didn't like this uh, habit of his of sneaking away from office. So uh, he, uh, he decided to come and check up on Lucy one day. And it was Wednesday, which is a playing day at the club. And uh, uh, everyone advised Lucy that don't go and play today because he's going to check up on you in the afternoon. So he said, doesn't matter, I know what to do. He called his, both his secretaries and in his uh, diary he wrote TPTCSC meeting. So uh, uh, his uh, Rajan said that, sir, what is this? He said, just tell him that I've gone to a TPTCSC meeting. He won't ask you anything more. So it meant to play tennis at the Calcutta South Club. <laughs> and <laughs> so uh, Sir Jami stormed into his room, found it empty, and called Rajan, where is he, where is he? He said, sir, he's gone to TPTC again. Okay, that's fine. Uh, okay. <laughs> so this, this is the sort of trick he used to play. Uh, and uh, very, very subtle and very nice. Oh, wonderful. Uh, in fact, I have to keep uh, note of time and I obviously want the audience to ask both of you some questions so I'll kind of wrap up uh, no I have one more question to finish in your close associations what is the one thing one most important thing that you have learned with your association with Mr. Rusi Modi Mr. Kumar to you first one very important that you'd like to share with the audience as a youngster I was uh, brought up with very strict religious background and uh, he loosened me up and I was a square. I mean, he said to tolerate people and don't uh, take an opinion. I won't walk here, I won't do this. He says, don't form an opinion. And uh, he, uh, he was so accommodating with everybody. His, uh, of course, uh, as you mentioned it time and again, his greatest contribution was uh, when I watched him to see how he related to the people of lower stature. That, uh, He's already pointed that out. But uh, he had an extraordinary talent. And one quick story I'll tell you. Coming back from a cricket match in a third class compartment, there was a fellow sitting next to him and Rusi talked to him and he said, what are you doing and so on and so forth. So he said, I'm going to go to the girls Rusi Modi meeting. So Rusi said, okay, how are you? He said, it's a little bit of a girl, but it's a so next morning at 9.30, this poor chap walked into Rusi's office and fainted. Because <laughs> he got the job. So. Mr. Chatterjee, one important thing that you learned, of the many that you, I'm sure, have and has stood you in good stead. Well, um, remain conscientious, stick by your values that, that you had imbibed. And uh, thankfully, he knew uh, our family he knew about my father. He knew what family I came of, and uh, that endeared him uh, to me even more. But uh, while he was speaking of sports, Naresh was, and Naresh was himself a very good tennis player, as you know or know. Uh, after all, he played with uh, Ramanathan Krishnan, who practically beat every player in the world at him in his time, excepting one, whom he mentioned. 
that was Manuel Santana. Manuel Santana played. You agree with me, uh, Naresh? Now, you talk about cricket. You know, he was talking about cricket on the way back, on the journey back. Now, you know, the late PSN Surita, who was a cricket commentator among other things, was a person who was very upset with Rusi Modi even in his dying days. Now, there was one person I found who was very upset. And I, mind you, I put the phone on to Rusi. There was no mobile in those days. So that, you know, they could make up. Somehow, you know, Rusi, I told Rusi about this. So, uh, Rusi was prepared on the other end. Rusi was then in the, 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 the penthouse of the Tata Center. So, I said, what are you so upset about, Pearson? And Pearson said, oh, no, 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 the way you speak, you know, I mean, this man is very strange. I said, what's so strange about him? Well, you know, he'll come in, and you don't know whether he's going to bowl, he'll just stare at you, keep staring at you. And then, you know, he'll just toss the ball in the air. Then I have to look in the air in the sky. The ball would go like that, a bowler. And then, you know, you know, it was coming right on my head. And I moved out because the ball would land on my head. And what do I find? It landed right on my middle step. You know, and, and apparently that was no accident because Rusi did it once too often. He mastered this art and I asked him about it. He said, well, you know, it happens more often than not, you're right, you know, and then I said, you know, Pearson is very upset, you have got to make up with him, after all, the poor chap, you know, is going, he said, but when you go, just put him on to me, you know, and I put it on, he says, hello, Lucy, he says, you're still thinking about that ball that bowled you, Lucy says, you know, he said, oh, that, you know, I can't get over that, so for heaven's sake, you're getting over life, what is a cricket ball and a will stamp for heaven's sake? That's the way he answered, blunt on his face. You see, be that as it may, yeah, Rusi was a person, I mean, very brief in one minute, had many, many, many qualities. If you were to narrate all the qualities along with the appropriate anecdotes, you know, you're going to take one full hour or one and a half, another one and a half hours. But it will be well worth the while of many people who are not here and of course, but the while of all those who are, you know, to hear a bit about Rusi, they will learn a great deal, especially the young ones. You see, after all, you're talking of reading, talking of Napoleon Bonaparte, he was a person who spoke, me at length, spoke at length why he considered Napoleon Bonaparte the first person who changed the course of European history. The second, in my opinion, was Mikhail Gorbachev, who brought the Iron Curtain down. But be that as it may, this man was into reading. He was never into computer. He was not into Googling. He never understood the computer, never understood anything. He never even handled a mobile phone. If, if a person says, Saab, ye phone kiye hai, to bolo landline me phone karne. So that was it. It's as simple as that. He would just not compromise. The, this was, uh, you know, in the last line, and I'll end with this, in arms on the man of George Bernard Shaw, you know, the hero is called Bloonshley. And the heroine, you know, when he once makes her final exit, you know, she says, What a man! Is he a man? That was George Bernard Shaw. To Rusi Modi, I would say, What a man! Was he a man? He well, was more than a man. Thank you, thank, thank you very much. Uh, well, one could go on and on and on, and I don't know how much of his examples we will be able to imbibe and carry forward. Some of us have been fortunate enough, I can see some sitting in front, Kulvin, uh, Ibrahim, some of us who have worked very closely with him. I'm sure we've taken a lot, but I'd like to open the question now to the audience, if they have anything in particular for Mr. Kumar. Yes, the lady, or Mr. Chatterjee, the lady in the... A very good evening to everyone here. Uh, today's session, this session especially, was my most awaited session for which I've, uh, I'd come here in the morning. So, uh, so I aspire to be a part of the corporate world. Now, a lot of the, my advisors tell me that in today's world, it's extremely important that you network well. Networking skills are very important, but I hate forcing people to give me their, or even asking them for their email addresses. So, so how did Mr. Modi do this? I mean, when you say that he was good at people skills, what did he do to network? Who would like to take that? During his time, uh this never had the impact that it has now and it wasn't so important and um, he, he withdrew really from this type of thing and 
he, I don't think he would have liked it very much and I don't know if he would handle it because uh, he wasn't so gadget minded, always someone did every, all the gadgets for him. So he would have to change a lot in, uh, if he were to live in today's world. Well, uh, I would take it uh, literally. When, when, I, when I talked of the example of uh, knowing everybody by name, and uh, the number went to thousands, if you could do that. You see, I mean, he had so many friends, both here and overseas. Incidentally, the Victoria Memorial is not lit, because, you know, you have to, because this place is lit. But the person who lighted the Victoria Memorial was a person, talking of people, and a person who was a very good friend from the royalty of England. The Duke of Edinburgh was in Hong Kong. He flew down from Hong Kong and he did the honours. And then they had a dinner, then he flew back to Hong Kong. Now the question is, right from the royalty down to the person who lived in that hut, everybody he knew, everybody he could keep in constant touch with in communication. And he did it literally. He did not have to go by Facebook or go by WhatsApp or go by, uh, you know, anything. You know, email, whatever. I mean, just try and ask him, Mr. Modi, can I have your email? He said, e what? You know, and, and the moment you, the way he would ask, that itself would give you the answer. You see, so he believed in mixing around, being friendly, and you know, he would find out if anybody had any problem. Anybody's problem was his problem. And he found out that Indian football was in tatters. We're talking of sport. Now he, India is 150 something ranked in the world. He started the Tata Football Academy, got the, the, you know, the golden era footballers like Chini Goswami, P.K. Banerjee, etc. to come and look after the Tata Football Academy. Later on, on his 89th, uh, you know, I mean, in 1989, he said, I remember watching the Sao Paulo, real Sao Paulo team, playing in, England, in Jamshedpur. And for a chief guest, he had Princess Diana's father, late father, Earl Spencer, you know, I mean, out there. I mean, I mean, this was this was. So amazing. I think uh, what the que the answer simply is, uh, ma'am, that with time things change. So the way when Mr. Modi networked, I think what you saw from the examples and what you've heard is very different from what you are going to network. So what communications was 50 years back today, you can't live without your mobile or your internet. But 50 years back, one didn't think of anything but the landline and a cyclo styling machine and the radio. So I think networking is important. How you do it is the methodology that changes with technology and time. Any other questions? Yes, the gentleman in the maroon sweater. So good evening all of you. Uh, the same thing, Mr. Modi was uh, working at Tata's and some maybe four decades back. And at that time, people were a little snobbish. And the fact that he was not a Tata, not part of the Tata clan, and still rose to the top, what was the qualities that made him apart from the rest? The Would you intrinsic share issue. that incident, how he became director of personnel. Okay. Yeah. You see, uh, let's get one thing clear. I mean, I, I said it earlier. You might it might have uh, crossed. Uh, the one uh, the one person who was instrumental was the gentleman after whom the headquarters of Tata's, the road in front of the Tata's headquarters in Bombay, is named. It's called Sir Homi Modi Street. That's named after Rusi Modi's father. He was very close to the Tatars. He was on the board of Tatars as well. And he really felt, looking at Rusi and the way Rusi was shaping, that you know he would make an excellent man person. In fact, without doubt, till today, you have not had in the world, and I'm not talking in just India, in the world, an industrial relations man and a people's man quite like him in the corporate sector. And this has been acknowledged by the Harvard School too. Thank you. There's a wonderful story that I think will exemplify how you well, uh, this is uh, from Rusi's very early days when he came back and he worked as a Kalasi, as he told you. And uh, uh, many, many years ago when there was a lot of trouble in the plant and they had thrown um, one of the foremen into the furnaces. And Rusi uh, was not aware of this, so he was walking into the works in his brief shorts and chapels going for work. and. Uh, 
the shout, the directors were holed up in a room and were rattled with the feeling fear, uh, were shouting at him, don't go, you'll get killed, don't go, you'll get killed. But uh, <coughs> Rusi paid no attention to it and walked straight into this very violent demonstration at the factory, at the works rather. And uh, uh, the, <coughs> the labor were taken aback because they were under the impression that they were going to come in and attack and so on and so forth. And here was Sir Homi Modi's son walking in uh, into all this trouble and sitting down in the road and saying, okay, what's the matter? Let me know and so on and so forth. And he wasn't attacked and he talked to them and cooled them down. And it was after this, Lucy told me, that J.R.D. Tata made him director of personnel because of his ability to handle people and of his ability to communicate with everybody. That was his real, real strength, his ability to talk to everybody and bring them close. And if I may just add to what the two panelists have said, if you notice, and I can speak through example of only the Tata group, while you agree, I, while you said what was said was right, that it was started by a family called the Tatas, it's one of perhaps the only groups in India which has allowed people to grow who are not part of the family, unlike other family businesses who try and keep within the family. And that's why the Tatas are so differentiated and they are so unique. I think that's one, one great uh, achievement that this group has done. Uh, yes, I will really end with this last question with the lady because we'll have to respect time. Good evening, sir. I work for Tata Steel and uh, I joined Tata Steel after the time uh, Modi, Mr. Modi was the MD. So I, yeah, uh, what I want to ask is, it's been many years since Mr. Modi was our MD, our chairman. Can you tell us two qualities that we need to carry on today to make us successful as people and as employees in a corporate? Two qualities. Yeah, there are many qualities you've spoken about. Each one of them is important. Two things are takeaway from this session that you could tell us. Mr. Chatterjee, Mr. Kumar, I think there have been many qualities, ma'am, that have been yes, said, and I think all of them are important. Yeah, I, uh, one particular quality, uh, one particular quality that I can uh, certainly speak of is uh, conscientiousness. You see, when uh, at the centre. Ministers take the oath of office. You see, those who decide to take it in English sometimes cannot pronounce the word. So they say instead, consciously. The word is conscientiously. And, you know, you have to be conscientious. You've also got to understand the people that, you know, you are working with very, very well. And you've also got to be, you know, when targets are set, everything is set, be ahead of the targets, you know, whatever you do, you know, and in the process, you see, if you are to add or if you want to revise, whatever you want to do, you still have time and you would do within the deadline. But there are many, many other things, you see, I'm not quite a, a quintessential corporate man, but then you see, I mean, this, this person is, so. But I think just to sum up, ma'am, I think what we've heard is leadership. I mean, there's no end to discussing about leadership, but I think what really separates the wheat from the chaff is leaders follow through example. And I think what we've learned from both Mr. Kumar and Mr. Chatterjee is that Mr. Modi was a man who followed through his example. So if he talked about punctuality, you knew that if there was a function in the plant at 7, he would be there at 7. If there was a dinner invitation at 6.30 in the evening, he'd be there at 6.30. If there was a, a officer's dialogue at 4.30 at uh, XLRI Auditorium, he'd be there at 4.30. And no one could ever outsmart unless, you know, force measure or something like that. So I think that's by quality. Uh, there was just one thing I wanted to add. Learn to laugh at yourself. That's one great thing about Rusi Modi. You see, no matter how serious or grim the situation, you know, what was gone, what has happened has happened. You would not carry back any kind of thing. There's no vindictiveness, nothing at all inside him. As he said, you see, talking about that one example, that man was made the head of collieries all over and he had nothing against him. But learn to laugh. And he was a person, if you were in his room, you know, when he was in Tata, as in, in Jamshedpur, you would see all the Lakshman sketches. I'm talking about R.K. Lakshman, who today is going to dialysis treatment in Pune. Now, 
the legendary cartoonist, this person had him in almost every picture you would see Rusi having a good laugh at himself and the way it, it has been depicted, each and every cartoon, that is a great quality. Thank you very much ladies and gentlemen. I think one could go on and on talking about this great man and the legend. I would like to thank Mr. Naresh Kumar for your time and all the uh, anecdotes and all the personal experiences that you've shared that have made him such a great man and your association with him. Thank you very much Mr. Upar Chatterjee for having shared your thoughts and what it was to be known to Rusi Modi and what he brought to the table. To all of you for being here this evening and to Tara Steele for this very, very special session. And I'm indeed very thankful for being given the honor and privilege to moderate. Thank you very much and have a very good evening.